Hello everyone, welcome to SumSub, a channel on how to survive, maybe even thrive, in the online jungle. And me, I'm Lucas, and I have absolutely nothing to hide, a clean slate, an open book. No drunken texts, cringy teenage MySpace updates, and certainly no large-scale Dogecoin laundering operations. Do you believe that? <laughs> no. Well, of course. Like all of you, I have things that I wouldn't like to advertise to the world. My question is then, why do government officials, internet giants, try to convince us that we don't have any dirty laundry to hide? Let's figure it out. I'm going fully transparent. Initially, the phrase, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to worry about, became the motto of the world's largest CCTV system. It all began when the first street cameras appeared in London in the 1960s. The capital was preparing for the state reception of the Thai royal family, and with the help of cameras, the police monitored the crowds in Trafalgar Square. Today, there are some 620,000 cameras operating in London, and every resident of London gets captured by these cameras up to 300 times a day. The maintenance of this system costs the city over £2 billion a year. Cameras have become a familiar thing on the streets of all major cities. Let me share some cool resources with you guys. Do you know how many cameras are watching you every day? There are several websites on the internet showing the density of CCTV cameras in the cities around the world. There are 20 times more of them in London than in New York and 70 times more cameras than in the city of Rome. The effectiveness of CCTV cannot be disputed, but the trouble is the same arguments. You have nothing to fear if you have nothing to hide. It has been used in the discussion of your digital freedoms. Well, let's explore a little bit more about how the digital space fundamentally differs from the streets of London. The most obvious thing is that the amount of information gathered about your actions. In the case of video surveillance systems, reality lags behind Hollywood. Modern systems cannot identify all the individual faces in a crowd. Within a certain probability, these systems can notice a passerby from a small list of wanted criminals and then this information can be provided to the authorities. However, there is simply not enough computing resources to process everyone in public. In addition, for accurate identification, the camera must be located at about the face level of the person and approximately at the level of their eyes. Not a simple task when we are talking about hundreds of thousands of cameras. Such conditions could be provided usually at the entrance of business centers or at ATMs, but certainly not everywhere on the streets of a city. So let's jump back a bit to how cameras help ensure public safety. In the case of an investigation of a crime that has occurred, Detectives will review the recordings from the camera near the scene of the crime. They start from where the incident occurred and then track back to where the criminal came from and where the criminal disappeared to. Moreover, it will only be possible to do this for just a couple of days. You see, no city video surveillance system stores footage older than a couple months by default. But monetary purchases are a little bit easier to track with the help of your bank. Payment data is generally stored for years. It's easy to process and analyze, and it is uniquely associated with your person. Just a couple of requests about the movement of money in your account will allow someone to identify your favorite store, get an idea of your typical expenses, and even highlight any unusual purchases. Anomalies in your expenses reveal important and specific information about you. Wow, what a geek. They spent $69.95 on a wonder mop. <laughs> That's me. For example, if you regularly start paying for breakfast at a cafe next to an oncological clinic, it is easy to conclude that either you have got a new job there, you're stalking a nurse, or unfortunately, have a very dangerous disease. Payments from a new employer or an increase in purchases at a pharmacy supply store will easily confirm if these predictions are true. Do not rush to use cash instead. It's not gonna save you. Your mobile operator already has detailed information about your movements. Even now, the police often use such data to establish where a suspect was at the time of a crime. Of course, this is only indirect evidence, but a further problem is that the positioning data of your phone isn't just used by law enforcement agencies. 
Today, state agencies and companies want to store as much information as they can get about us, online and offline. They want to have the possibility to track our lives and they want to store them for all time. If you like to run in the morning, you've probably heard about the Strava app. It helps monitor training intensity, it maps out the route of your workout, and it allows you to share that with other users of the application. In November 2018, Nathan Rusa, a True Blue Australian cybersecurity researcher, concluded that this fitness tracker could pose a serious threat to the lives of American soldiers in Syria. Among the 13 billion records out of the system, he singled out the tracks that gave out the position of military bases in the Middle East. Had terrorist organizations had access to this data, well, they could have easily set up ambushes or attacks during Captain America's morning jog. Strava's security policy was promptly changed, and thankfully, Captain America is still with us today. But this is just one of a hundred similar examples. We highlighted this a ton on our channel here, and I will repeat it again and again. In the digital world, we leave more traces than in our ordinary lives. Data privacy is dead. Why? Because this millennial is the millennial of transparency. To create a system that finds motorists for speeding and collects a fee for entering the center of London, programmers had to teach computers to distinguish between different car numbers. But this task is much easier than face recognition. Even the most advanced facial systems can sometimes be deceived by using particular hairstyles and makeup, which are aimed at disorientating algorithms. Perhaps in the coming years, we will see an increase in outlandish fashion, correlating with an increase in civil disobedience. If you're going to burn down the capitalist system, you may as well do it in style while thwarting facial recognition at the same time. Why not, right? Now imagine the government wants to force you to wear unique numbers on your clothes, perhaps even a QR armband. These numbers would allow street cameras to track your movements more accurately and thus protect you from criminals. You would agree, wouldn't you? If you've got nothing to hide, why worry about it? Large internet companies already act this way, in fact. A unique identifier is assigned not to you personally, but to your digital double. And for some reason, it doesn't really seem to bother people. In addition, we are yet to touch on another important point. Remember that surveillance cameras are installed only in public places. They do not look into your windows. They do not spy on you in your apartment. Therefore, even police officers wouldn't be able to assess your Beyonce concerts in the shower. But the camera of your smartphone can and does regularly see some things that aren't intended for prying eyes. And these photos and videos can first get onto the cloud storage, and from there they can end up in the wrong hands. Of course, there is nothing criminal in terribly framed pictures, let alone more provocative selfies you take. But I doubt you want all of your colleagues and business partners to see them. And it turns out there is also something to hide here, although you're not doing anything particularly illegal. I right, just want you to look at some photos, tell me what you think. This is an absolutely real threat. Remember September 1st, 2014? This day has entered the history books of cybersecurity as Celebgate, when 200 private photos of celebrities appeared on 4chan and Reddit at the same time. Perhaps you remember that hackers had entered into the iCloud of accounts for Rihanna, Kirsten Dunst, Jennifer Lawrence, and released dozens and dozens of their private photos. The hacker was caught, and Ryan Collins received an 18-month service in prison. But can this compensate for the blow to the reputation and privacy of the victims? And yet, there are still more controversial situations. Just imagine that the authorities are interested in you because six months ago, you spent several hours reading articles about the production of methamphetamine online. Now, this information has remained with Google and now you're under investigation. Of course, you think it will be easy to prove that you just wanted to check out if Breaking Bad was authentic. And of course, you had no real intention of actually setting up a Walter White style business at all. You probably don't even remember what you read then, but search engines certainly will remember. Gross, fat, butthole, dick, poop. Is that what kids are into these days? <laughs> are your parents home? Finally, you may really have nothing to hide. You have nothing to worry about. A squeaky clean individual, congratulations. At least according to the laws of the country in which you live. 
But your law abidance in Britain or the USA may be interpreted quite differently in other countries. For example, if you were in the United Arab Emirates a couple of years ago, your child's smartphone could have caused you some serious problems. You see, in this country, there are strict bans on gambling and some kinds of electronic games. In particular for this example, the mobile game Roblox was banned in 2018. It may never have occurred to you, but if your child had this app on their phone, you would be breaking the law. I'm the bad guy. Similarly, your digital footprint left when releasing troves of US military secrets online could, I don't know, land you in the UK prison facing extradition charges to the States. A scary jungle we are now navigating. It's obvious when you travel to another country, but accidentally crossing the border in a virtual space is all too easy. Let's take one more example of how complicated this can be. Imagine that you are gay and you decide to flirt a little online with an unknown man. Only texts, no videos, no pictures, just letters and emojis. Do you realize that such correspondence could cause the imprisonment of the person you're speaking to? Meanwhile, in Morocco, Tunisia, Afghanistan, and 70 other countries, same-sex relationships are a criminal offense. So even if you have nothing to hide, insufficiently protecting your information can play a fatal role in the fate of other people. Drawing an analogy with CCTV, imagine now that we have cameras from the Taliban, North Korea, or Saudi Arabia hanging on the streets of London or New York, and other countries are watching you through the lens of their own laws. We took it for granted at the beginning of this video, but are ordinary CCTV cameras even effective in their original role? You see, when they were installed in Britain all that time ago, the government promised that they would actually help reducing the crime rate. And in fact, if you look at these figures, the number of cameras does not correlate at all with the number of crimes committed. They do not prevent new cases, but only help to deal with crimes that have already happened. Knowing about the cameras, the criminal will try to hide their face. And remember that bank robbers began to use masks long before cameras started appearing on our streets. And yet, this year, a billionth surveillance camera is going to be appearing on the planet. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Why do many of us casually claim that we have nothing to hide? Perhaps viewers of our channel are savvy enough to see through this, but we all know people who are quite naive and do believe it. This is just a defense mechanism. People consider such openness to be protection, a strategic advantage in our relation with authority. We are trying to negotiate the system in advance to show our trustworthiness, that we are law-abiding. But often we don't quite realize how vulnerable our position can become due to the ever-shifting nature of data privacy and digital boundaries. Many underestimate the importance of the information they own. While we often appreciate the risk of a stolen bank card or keys to your house, Often we don't even notice the danger posed to our digital identities. Privacy is about power. It's about how much power the government should have to explore uh, the deepest parts of our lives. How much information should the government have? What should the government be able to do with that information? Sometimes we don't distinguish well between the boundaries of our personal lives and other people's secrets. That you share a photo from your birthday party on Instagram. This is your holiday, your party, your guests. But of course, each of them can have their own secrets, their own private lives. For example, to congratulate you, one of your friends lied about his plans to their boss. And an innocent post of your picture, it can seriously complicate their career or even cause their dismissal. We often confuse our own transparency and work, as journalists and detectives increasingly are losing their opportunity to hide their sources of information, for example. Should they use insecure messages and opt out of email encryption? In my opinion, the answer is obvious. Those who give up liberty for safety deserve neither. A poignant quote from Benjamin Franklin, the founding father of America would never have imagined that these words spoken in the 18th century would be so relevant in the digital reality of the 21st. Well, thanks for accompanying me on this somewhat unsettling stroll through the digital jungle. And definitely don't hide the fact that you are watching SumSub. Check back in for more curious queries, suave suited Brits, and the information that you need to survive it all. Freedom of speech doesn't have a lot of meaning if you can't have a quiet space, a space within yourself, within your mind, within the community of your friends, within your home. 
to decide what it is that you actually want to say. Arguing that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is like arguing that you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Do you want a world where companies can data mine your phone? They can get, extract your data, contact all your details. Do you want a world, for instance, where health insurance companies will apply a higher premium because you haven't done enough steps or because you haven't logged in your workouts or because you gained 4% body fat? Equally essential to what it means to be a free and fulfilled human being is to have a place that we can go and be free of the judgmental eyes of other people.